action. Okay, thank you. This is, uh, we continue chapter 11, if I would remember correctly. So, we are up to 11. Uh, tricky and confusing topic, the euro currency market. concept originally that was developed is the concept of euro dollars cool. euro dollars are dollars deposited outside the United States dollars deposited in Germany in England in Bulgaria or in any Argentina, Mexico, or in any, any other country in the world. And from Euro dollars grew the concept of Euro currency. Is a currency deposited, we also like to use the word banked, banked outside its home country. So, example will be Euro Yen. <coughs> Euro Yen. In Euro Yen, it would be Japanese Yen deposited or banked outside of Japan. It's important for you to understand that the prefix euro has nothing to do with the currency euro, so it's totally and completely unrelated. Second, it's important to understand that it's not related to Europe. It was originally, when the name first was coined, it meant that these are dollars deposited in Europe. That was how it originally uh, was developed. But later on would mean dollars deposited in Japan, in Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, or any other country around the world. So from there, so that there is no confusion, the, the term is even more confusing, is called the Euro Euro. The Euro Euro. So the Prefix euro means outside the home of the currency. So euro euro would be euros which are banked and deposited outside the euro currency. Euro euros are extremely popular in my home country of Bulgaria. Bulgarians love to keep their money in euro. And Bulgaria is in the European Union but not in the Eurozone. Our <coughs> currency is not the Euro. We got our Bulgarian currency called the Lev. And many people are more distrustful of Bulgarian politicians as opposed to European. Of course, you should not trust both. They are equally untrustworthy. But Bulgarians, Bulgarian politicians are less trustworthy than Europeans and the European currency for us is more trustworthy and we like to keep a big chunk of our own savings in Euro deposits as opposed to LEV, that's the Bulgarian currency LEV deposits. So we got a lot of Euro Euro deposits in Bulgaria. Of course we got a lot of Euro dollar deposits in Bulgaria. We have almost <coughs> no Euro Yen for some reason banks and people there's no demand there's no supply for euro yen this is just the yen is not very popular as a currency in uh, Bulgaria so this is the terminology which is fairly confusing now in the textbook they like to use and uh, I can clarify they use a tiny little dash euro dash euro 
uh, depends on the language. Euro, Euro with a dash would be more British English. In Euro, Euro without a dash, Americans would like to cut out the dash and join the word together as one. So this is purely linguistic, uh, fairly irrelevant. OK, now let's do a topic. Uh, the next topic within this is called the birth or genesis. Genesis or birth of the euro currency market. Uh, I will do, in the meantime, a topic related to this. It is called, and I'll write it with uh, letters in red, the law of unintended consequences. This is the most important and at the same time the most difficult law to understand in economics. It is perfectly, perfectly common sense. It is the one law that politicians don't understand, can't understand, and will never understand. It's beyond the mental capabilities and, cons uh, and competences of politicians. It uh, goes like this in the form of an example. Um, in Canada, in Canada, they decide that cigarettes are bad for smoking. And the government says, oh, we're going to ban cigarettes, OK? And when they ban cigarettes, of course, like anything which certainly becomes illegal, the price of cigarettes skyrockets, could easily go 5, 10, or 15 times higher on the black market. Well, this is what happens. The unintended consequence of banning, of banning cigarettes was a skyrocketing and booming market for marijuana. Because marijuana is what well, was also illegal at the time, but marijuana had a very well-developed black market for many decades with the well-established networks suppliers, customers, and everything else, and suddenly, cigarettes being outlawed, totally unintended consequence was a skyrocketing demand and supply of marijuana. And marijuana became a booming <coughs> business because marijuana was as expensive or even cheaper than cigarettes because supply was well developed and, it, and the black, black market was well developed, yet, yet at the same time, cigarettes are illegal and you need a lot of time to establish the illegal uh, channels of importing it, of distributing it, and all <laughs> the other. So it's a simple unintended consequence which, as soon as Canadian politicians would observe, they notice, they notice that, oh, we can't do that. It is even worse. Marijuana business is booming, and it has little or no effect. So that's one example of law of unintended uh, consequences. Now, uh, let's try uh, another example. Again, I'm just trying to illustrate for you because uh, uh, usually a law of unintended consequences means you gotta, when you do something legally or in a regulatory way, you gotta think usually one, sometimes two steps ahead. And politicians can't typically do that. I mean, they can't think two moves forward. You know, they usually think of today for what it will do today. They don't think about tomorrow. So um, New York uh, is well known, notorious around the world for extremely high rent prices. And the mayor of New York says, oh, I'm going to win a lot of votes and all of these great things if I make a popular 
measure, it's actually a populist measure, I'm going to put rent controls. And when I put rent controls, I'm going to get to benefit, I'm get, going to get to benefit the local citizens. Wouldn't it be great if the mayor comes and says the rent is no more than 1,000 euro, even in Brussels, right? Wouldn't it be great? Well, a politician would think it will be great, but turns out that there are some unintended consequences. And the first unintended consequences was amazingly simple. Uh, uh, of course, even a kid would forecast that you're going to get a shortage of housing. If rent is 1,000 euro and you got a nice, big, luxury apartment with all the great things which would cost on the market three or 4,000 euro, first, you wouldn't even bother renting your apartment. Or you're going to find a relative or somebody else, you're going to evade this whole thing. So when you put a ceiling on rents, the price, sorry, the supply goes down. So you put a ceiling on rents, a lot of apartments and property will get out of the market. At the same time, because they are now cheap, demand will go up. So suddenly, if the market price for rents, let's say in Berlin, I'm picking numbers, they're probably good but not quite, will be 1,500 euro. And you say that the new rents are limited at 500, a lot of people will be eager to rent and few people will be eager to offer the rent. And the result will be too many renters and nobody willing to do the renting, meaning landlords. So it's a phenomenal shortage, phenomenal shortage of apartments. And that was the first unintended <coughs> consequence. People looking everywhere for, this, you know, for apartments and you couldn't find it anywhere. But the story gets better. As you get shortage uh, and rental prices, prices are fixed, now being a landlord is not a very good business because you can't get a lot of money out of it. Well, if landlording is not a good business, the second unintended consequence is that demand for investment property falls. So, you don't want to invest anymore in an apartment which you're going to rent for 500 euro in Berlin. You've got to be stupid to do that, right? And of course, landlords and businesses are not stupid. They just are not going to do it. So demand for property falls, and therefore, prices of property won't keep up. And here is the other key. There is no new construction of property. So suddenly, there is a shortage of property, and yet there is no construction. So shortage is the first unintended consequence, but the second unintended consequence is killing construction. So now you don't have new supply, and the job market for construction suffering. Okay, but here is another third unintended consequence, which was way beyond the capability of New York mayor is, hey, if I'm going to be renting this apartment for $1,000, but the market rent is $2,000, I will do the maximum amount of profit by, and here is a genius landlord, not doing any repair whatsoever. I'm not going to fix this, I'm not going to fix that, I'm not going to fix the door, I'm not going to fix windows, I'm not going to fix anything because that's going to eat away from my profit. And if they don't like it for 1000 they can leave and I'm going to find easily another tenant. So the third unintended consequence was this repair. The apartments were not maintained. Property was not maintained. There was no economic incentive to maintain the property because you could not benefit, you could not profit from it. Okay. Well, as construction stalled and the city is booming, now you got more and more and more demand. Suddenly, there is a total and completely public outcry. 
people are angry at the mayor because there is shortage and the cause of the shortage is the fixed prices. So now the mayor can't go back and say, oh, we're going to allow higher market prices. But the mayor says the following, because he's going to lose a lot of votes. The mayor says the following, well, we will allow higher rents and market rents only if you leave your old regulated rent and you want to re-rent the new rent, so all new rentals will be at the high price. So now you got a two-tier market, and it gets worse. With a two-tier market, you got the regulated rents at 1,000, and now the free market rents are at 3,000. Well, you begin to think you're a landlord and say, I got this tenant who's paying me only 1,000. If I can get rid of this sucker, I can re-rent the apartment for 3,000. So suddenly, landlords begin to harass <laughs> their tenants in every possible way to make their life miserable to the point where the tenant hates the landlord and the property so that the tenant will leave the apartment, so that the tenant will leave the apartment, okay, and the landlord can re-rent it for 3000 So what would it be doing to, as a landlord to get rid of your tenant? Well, number one, very easy. Break the water pipeline and get you know, deprive the property from water. Suddenly, the property is for one week or for two weeks out of water, okay? They will damage their own building just to get rid of these people. And after these people go out, they're gonna fix it, but we'll re-rent it at the much higher price and make a huge profit on it, okay? So suddenly, buildings are without water. Suddenly, if you're the landlord, what you want to do is you want to cut the electricity. And when you cut the electricity, especially in the winter, and people are heating with you know, electricity, suddenly you got buildings with no electricity. And people are forced, whether they like it or not, because you cut it not by switching off. You literally cut the cables. And by the time the electricity company comes down, by the time the electricity company comes down to fix it, it takes a week, it takes two weeks, people can't live that longer, but it gets better. Now landlords say they cut their own electricity, the electric company comes, then the other guy cuts off the electricity, the electric company comes and fix it. So landlords get their act together and say, okay, come 31st, we're all going to cut the electricity at the same time. And we're gonna flood the electric company so that the electric company cannot do thousands of properties, all right? So these people get their act together. So they start cutting the electricity, and later on as these, as the, all of these properties get to be ex uh, extremely unprofitable, as rent controls have been running for many, many years, it gets to the ultimate, to the ultimate response from landlords. The most profitable deal for the landlord, while the tenants are there, is to destroy the building, literally. And when you destroy the building, you just smash the building or whatever, they will rebuild and put a brand new building that will benefit from the new market rents. Because now market rents would go up to $4,000, all right? But at the same time, the regulated rent is $1,000. So as you see, as the government is progressing to make things and to keep things going in the regulated way, people have economic incentives to find ways around it. And these were all one after another an unintended consequence after an unintended consequence after an unintended consequence and that's basically the genesis of the euro currency market 1957 was the first very simple step i'm here on page 422 for you to follow 422 for you to follow 
British government, British government prohibits banks from lending pounds to finance to finance non-British trade. So, government, government prohibits prohibits uh, lending to non-British businesses. Well, here's the key. The government says you can't lend pounds, pounds, British pounds, to British businesses. And the bank says, oh, sure, no problem. Uh, you guys uh, want uh, dollars? And they say, yeah, OK. So we let you dollars. <laughs> Done deal, OK? So the government simply says, oh, you cannot lend British pounds to non-British businesses. Let's say German business may want to borrow British pounds. And government says, no, cannot lend to the British bank. You cannot lend to the German business British pounds. And then the, uh, the, the bank says, do you guys want dollars? And the German business says, sure. Remember, that's 1957. Germany is still relatively weak. It's still, well, it's barely, barely recovering after World War II. OK, this is barely 10 years after World War II. So suddenly, this government prohibition of British pounds results in a booming, booming dollar. <coughs> In this particular case, correct to say euro dollar business. Euro dollar business. So here is a simple thing which a government does, and suddenly it, cre it, you know, it creates the birth of a brand new business which will become the, one of the biggest businesses, oh, sorry, biggest areas in finance in the world. So simple unintended consequence and suddenly British banks are running dollar businesses. In other words, suddenly they do euro dollars. So that's a simple easy step number one. Oh, well, guess what? Next step is 1960 or 60s, doesn't matter. Now, U.S. government is doing the next stupid stuff. As the U.S. government declares war on, uh, uh, sorry, Vietnam War and goes into war and suddenly the government's got to borrow a lot but it's still on a quasi, quasi uh, gold standard, suddenly there is a shortage of funding, shortage of financing in the United States and suddenly the U.S. government prohibits or discourages, let's say it prohibits, U.S. banks from, and here's the key, lending to non-U.S. to non-U.S citizens and businesses. Pretty much the same story. Oh, you're a U.S. bank, you can't lend to Germans, you can't lend to this, you can't lend to that, you can't do this kind of lending, okay? But you got, you're an American bank and you got a lot of extra money, okay? So you want to lend them, uh, you want to lend, I don't know, to Romania or Poland or Germany for 7%, but you can't. Well, if you can't lend to them 7%, what you'll do is easy. Deposit the money in the UK or in a German bank. They deposit the dollars in a German bank, and then they will borrow from the German bank, all right? So, it creates the so-called Euro deposits. And then the money is re-lent. So, you do the lending with, by using an intermediary in 
the UK. Well, the way it will work is very simple. The American bank will open its own subsidiary in London. It will open its own subsidiary. And then the US bank will deposit its own money in its own subsidiary in London. And now its subsidiary in London will lend to France, to Germany, or wherever else in the world they want to lend. Okay? It's amazingly simple. Question? Question? So, you're an American bank. You say, okay, we're going to open our own bank in London. They open their own bank in London. Then they finance it with their surplus money from the US. And then, if you're the German business, you wouldn't borrow from the American bank. You'd borrow from the British bank, from the subsidiary, British subsidiary of the American bank. Well, here is another major, major impetus to, for American man, banks to start rushing and opening new branches in London. And this gives another impetus in booming business, mostly in London, but also elsewhere in the world, to open banks that will take deposit in dollars and then lend or make loans in US dollars. So that's number two. Let's see what I what else I have. Number three. Nineteen seventies. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's not in the book, but it's an important thing. If I remember correctly, it is known as Reg Q, Regulation Q. In Regulation Q is something very simple. Uh, US government says, oh, interest rates are rising 7%, 8%, 10%, 12%. Interest rates on deposit are rising so much that interest rate deposits, sorry, deposits, uh, uh, interest rates on deposits are killing American banks. They're killing American banks. In other words, because you got a war going on in Vietnam, you got a lot of other things. There is welfare systems. The government is running huge deficits. There is a shortage of capital in the United States. And the shortage of capital is driving everybody. Banks to borrow money to attract funds. Government to borrow money and attract funds. And they're saying these interest rates, like 12, 14, 16% interest rates, are killing the banks because the banks got to pay the money to keep the deposit, to pay the interest rate. If the bank doesn't pay the money, you're going to take the money out and move it in the other bank. So in a competitive banking system, you cannot really do this unless you put a regulation that says, limit on interest rate, I'm making up the number, is only 8%. You can't pay 9, you can't pay 12. So suddenly all banks are saying, finally we can make some good money. We can pay 8 and we can lend at 14 and maintain a huge spread because these deposits were killing us. Well, the unintended consequence of Reg Q, which was supposed to increase bank profitability, was the exact opposite. It totally and completely crushed and destroyed American mm -hmm. banks because, oh, you're going to pay me 8%? I can deposit the money in London for 13%. Do you guys think I'm that kind of stupid to deposit an 8? Because you, the government, said 8, when I can deposit in London for 13%, which is the market rate. So suddenly this reg Q, which is the same as known as interest rate ceiling, the result was outflow of capital from US, outflow of capital, think of it as money, think of it as deposits, which were redeposited or deposited, however you said, redeposited in 
London and other markets in Europe. Uh, Switzerland would be one of them, uh, would be another one. And then from there, they're going to be three left. So if the interest rate on loans is 16%, that's the market interest rate, London could easily offer 13, keep a spread of three, and make a juicy profit with a 3% spread. And American banks thinking that, oh, we will pay on deposit 8%, we'll charge 16, and we'll make a killing. Well, guess what? Reg Q killed most American banks because now American banks were bleeding capital because all depositors will rush to take their money out of the US banks, transfer them to London or other European centers. And what happened was now a capital squeeze. Money coming out of US banks and even coming out of the US financial system and moving into the European system. And now, not only there was a shortage initial of capital, but now capital is fleeing the country. And this literally crushed both American banks, American lending, and led to a major crisis later on in the 70s, to the point where, after many years later, the government would realize that they made a devastating mistake. Question? Yeah, sorry, but uh, Q is quotation and ER is internet in interest rate? Uh, no, reg Q. Uh, regulations uh, of banking regulations in the US will be KL, regulation K, regulation L, regulation R, regulation uh -huh. S. So they, they just used a letter over here. Q has nothing to do with quotation. Okay. quotation. Now, IR stands for interest rate. In finance, in economics, uh, in macro especially, we like to shorten interest rate to IR, interest rate, okay? So interest rate ceiling suddenly results in a major outflow of capital. Well, I mean, uh, that a and the result is it's redeposited somewhere else, okay? Uh, now, similar thing happened in Europe, for example, uh, as Bulgaria got into the European Union, and the European Central Bank is maintaining relatively low interest rates. Uh, a lot of European capital entered Bulgaria, and, for example, in Europe, they can get 3-4% return on their money. They can bring that capital to Bulgaria, and in Bulgaria they can get 8, 10% return. So it is somewhat similar, the capital outflow from Western Europe to Eastern Europe, but there was no fundamental problem by doing that because Western Europe had a surplus of capital. And when you have a surplus of capital and interest rates are low, capital will migrate to where interest rates are higher. So this is not a problem in itself for Europe. But for the US, it was a fundamental problem because there was an underlying shortage of capital in the first place. So they were already short on capital. They didn't have deposits, OK? And now the little that was left was also fleeing to, into Europe. So this was the biggest, biggest uh, impetus. So, these were the genesis and birth, and this is what made the market truly big and truly prosperous. Right, First, to the point where now, even in my home country of Bulgaria, uh, you're gonna have, we now call them, uh, okay, new word, red, new word, red, Euro loans. An Euro loan is simply a loan made in a foreign currency. Polish banks were doing a lot of loans in Euro and a lot of loans in uh, Swiss francs. Our Bulgarian banks were doing a lot of loans in Euros and a lot of loans in Swiss francs. And so you have a, with the result of course of the uh, Euro dollar market is that as soon as you get the Euro dollar deposits, they will be re lent into a euro loans, okay? So the dollars will be lent as dollar loans 
to someone in Poland or someone in Bulgaria or back in England business world. So this is step number three. Let me see if I got number four or don't have. Yes, number four. Step. So now let's try to do this. So this is like one big thing. This is like a second big thing. This is a third big thing. And now the fourth big thing is known as, and I'll <coughs> write it as a term. It's not in the book. I'll be explaining it. Uh, meaning they talk about it, but don't really explain it. Petrodollar recycling. For you guys, understand, petro means oil, means crude oil. Petro dollars are dollars which are received by oil exporting countries like Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Iran, ba uh, 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 Ku Kuwait, and whoever else is uh, uh, Qatar. They have little, they don't have oil, they got a lot of gas. And of course, Libya. And of course, Libya. So they will be getting paid in US dollars for their own for their oil. So dollars that are received in payment for crude oil and gas are called petrodollars. Okay? That's the name of a that's what it is, what it's what it means. That's the definition. So you are now Kuwait or Iraq or any other country, let's say Saudi Arabia, you get these dollars, let's say from the US government or any other government, if you are one of those countries You'll be afraid to deposit them in a U.S. bank because the U.S. government will declare you evil, will declare you bad, will declare you terrorist, or for any other reason, the U.S. government will just seize your petrol dollars if you're not good enough. And that happened to Iran. Iran was declared for whatever reasons. It, they seized Iranian assets or assets of the Iranian government, of Iranian businesses, and even of Iranian ordinary citizens. They seized them completely. So, you don't want to keep your dollars in the U.S. Well, you can keep them in a more trustworthy environment and more reliable legally, and that will be number one choice. London. So what happened was all of these countries when they receive oil exporting countries in the 70s oil prices went up from about a dollar 20. They went all the way up to dollar 45. After the first oil crisis in 73, 74 with the Yom Kippur, Kippur, uh, Kippur War you had oil prices go from two, three dollars to ten dollars. So suddenly, revenues for all of these countries like Kuwait went up five times. That way too much surplus money. Hey guys, guys, all right? They had way too much surplus money, countries like Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and they would deposit their surpluses in London banks again as Euro dollars. The recycling means uh, the following. The recycling means that they'll deposit the money in a London bank and then the London bank will make a loan to Argentina, will make a loan to Brazil, make a loan to Peru, make a loan to a bunch of Latin American countries, but not so many loans at that time in the 70s to Asia, but to Latin America. And this will precipitate the so-called, later on, Latin American financial crisis. Financial crisis. Uh, when, the, when the U.S. seizes the money of the Iranians, does that mean they freeze it? Like they cannot... Uh... Well, that, that's the first step. The first step, they freeze it. So what does... Oh, seize means they just take it. Okay, but that doesn't only happen in the U.S. It can happen 
Also yeah, it could happen anywhere in the world, but the British are smart enough not to do it. But like what happened uh, in Libya, I think they freeze the money all over. He had, he had money in, uh, I don't know, in Switzerland. And okay, well, now, now it's two different things. Are we talking about Muammar Gaddafi's personal stuff? Okay. Or we're talking about Libya's government stuff? Or we're talking about Libyan businesses? Or we're talking about Libyan citizens? They decided and they declared him bad and evil yeah. and terrorist and all those they bad the right, right. Uh, uh, and all those other things. And the whole thing was very different. I, mean, I don't want to get into that. Is uh, Gaddafi was smart enough not to keep his money in dollars, but to keep most of his wealth in gold. And as the West was running short on gold, they needed to put their hands on huge piles of gold. We're talking about tons and tons of gold. So, what by going through the war and everything else, they'll seize some of the gold. That's the one thing. So they'll just get it straight. Just, it's called stealing, right? But the other part is, if you get to destroy the country economically and financially, for the country to be rebuilt, the country will have to give their gold deposits as a security or better, they'll be forced to sell it on the market. So it was all a scheme about laying their hands on Libya's gold. Because Libya is the only central, uh, uh, well, one of the very, very few, the other one will be Iran's central bank uh, in the world, that doesn't want to play the dollar game and didn't want to keep dollars on reserves chose uh, gold, and this was disrupting the financial games of Central Bank of the US and Britain and later on Europe, okay? So he wasn't playing by the rules of the Western Central Banks, which uh, were basically, hey, you're gonna hold our dollars and we're gonna print those dollars and depreciate them and you're gonna take a loss on the newly depreciated dollars, and we're gonna get the, bain, uh, the, 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 the profit from the, from the new printing dollars. So instead, so he was basically, you know, they could print all they want, he wouldn't take any loss because he kept gold. And as they print dollars, the price of gold goes up, his value and his central bank would even gain in value relative to everybody else. Okay, so they wouldn't allow him to do that. It's all about <coughs> the goal. Okay? And uh, uh, London is safer than Switzerland? Uh, yes, in London they're a lot safer. Now, unless you get uh, the whole uh, 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 no, country, uh, London and UK, being against Iran, where let's say the, uh, the the Security Council of the United Nations, the UN Security Council, will decree that the whole country and the person, everything is bad, <laughs> so that everybody can go and steal. Then they say, oh yeah, but it was a UN Security Council resolution. Uh, we are not touching people's money. We're you know only this guy because that's what the, you know the UN Security. So. Under the protection of U.S. Security Council, they could do that, as before they did with Saddam Hussein. Okay. Yeah, but talking in general, London banks are safer than uh, like Switzerland. No, 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 no. I never said that they are safer. I never said that. All I was said is that they are safer from government confiscation. Oh. That's a completely different. See, so, in other words, the <coughs> legal environment in the U.K. is proven to be a lot safer than the U.S. legal environment. In other words, the British government is not going to go and use their banks to steal the money. Well, the U.S. government will do it, okay? Now, in terms of legality, the safest place until recently was Switzerland. But now, the Swiss government, the American government and the IRS would pressure Switzerland to give away its, uh, you know, its American depositors, and the Swiss government will actually give to the American government uh, the American the information, and suddenly, you're American with a Swiss bank, you're not anymore safe, okay? So suddenly, 
You don't want to keep your money in the Swiss banks, and even worse, the American government is pressuring the Swiss government to close the money on the American uh, citizens, and here is the key, and to transfer the money into a US bank back home so that they can get their hands on it, okay? That's, you know, uh, 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 the American government is getting hungry, rapacious to get more money. That happens less in London. Yes, this would happen. The British government will not be as cooperative, and the London city is run under different laws. So, when this thing happened to when this thing happened to Switzerland, who was the primary beneficiary of this whole thing? You were there, Singapore. When the American government pressured Singapore to give. Uh, you know, to give uh, all of their American depositors and all the banking six, etc. Singapore says, get the hell out of here. <laughs> get the hell, we're not going to give you anything. And basically Singapore became, is now is the, and of course Hong Kong is the more attractive center because the money is safer there. Not because the safe, it's, uh, sorry, the bank, it cannot go bankrupt, but because the government is not going to cooperate or there won't be any seizure or any other problems. And I was the, there could be, but the risks are significantly lower. And that's what it's all about. So now the euro dollar business is booming in Hong Kong and Singapore because Switzerland is steadily losing, is steadily losing its dominance in terms of banking secrets. Okay? And that's actually the latest and greatest development. So if you're a business, you want to get a loan, it's a lot cheaper, a lot easier, a lot faster, quicker to get the loan straight from Singapore or from Hong Kong. And many are doing just that. Okay, Many other businesses, not only in Asia, but also in Europe, you can just borrow from Hong Kong. Yeah, of course, now interest rates are extremely low in the European Union, so you can borrow cheaply from Europe, you can borrow cheaply from uh, London, but the whole idea is fairly straightforward. So this is yet, and here, the unintended consequence was, uh, let's uh, talk about the Latin American financial crisis, is uh, again, something amazingly simple. These guys were getting billions and billions of petrodollars. The banks were wondering who would want to, you know, who could they lend it to. And because they were getting huge money, you can't make loans, uh, $50,000, $20,000, $1,000,000. You can't make these loans. Uh, they have big money, so they'll make $5 billion loan to Mexico, $3 billion loan to Argentina, $7 billion loan to Brazil. So they'll be lending billions of dollars to Latin American countries. And these loans were typically, as it's done by uh, London banks, on a floating exchange rate. As market interest rates go up, the country's got to pay higher interest rate. If the market interest rate goes down, they got to pay a lower interest rate. So as the US got into serious trouble in the late 70s with inflation, the US government was forced to raise interest rate in 1980. They got Paul Volcker to raise interest rates on short-term rates all the way to 21%. And suddenly, all of these Latin American countries, their economies were crushed. Now, if you would remember what they were talking about, uh, uh, the video that the country, because oil prices were skyrocketing. Later on, they went to $20 and $30 and $40. They needed the money to pay for oil, right? Jamaica was short on money, they had to pay. They needed to borrow dollars in order to pay for the oil. Well, this is where some of those loans came from. Some of those loans came from the IMF, but most of the loans for the countries like which were not bankrupt like Jamaica, which were like Brazil and Argentina and Mexico and so on, these countries would borrow directly from the London banks, okay? So commercial banks will not lend to Jamaica, they'll lend to Argentina. 
And the result was that the Argentinian uh, government, as well as businesses, uh, Brazil and so on, Latin American countries would get into serious debt. And as soon as interest rates go up, suddenly these will go, these countries will go bankrupt. And suddenly <coughs> you're going to get yourself into a major Latin American financial crisis. Well, they'll go bankrupt because as the US government raises interest rates to 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 percent, these extremely high interest rates in the U.S. will attract capital from everywhere in the world back into the U.S. And the capital will start flowing out of Latin America, Europe, and whatnot. And this will precipitate a crisis elsewhere in the world. And the result was a major Latin American financial crisis. <laughs> a lot of countries went bankrupt. And that was great for the IMF. IMF is back in business. They can lend more money to bankrupt Latin American governments. A whole different story altogether. So, uh, uh, it's going long. Let's do a little bit of the attractions. So, this is the genesis, and this is how the market has been growing throughout uh, the decades. Now, attractions or benefits. Why do bankers love it. What's so attractive and good about it? And very simple. No government. Okay, let's put a little number here because I've been doing numbers today. No government. No government regulations. So it's basically an unregulated market. So if you're a bank, you can do whatever you want to do with these euro dollars. You can do, you can lend, you can whatever. It's all up to you. You have no interest rate ceilings, no interest rate floors. You don't have mount limitations. Uh, hey, you're free to do business as you please. Bankers love it. And businesses would also love it. Businesses don't want to deal with government regulations and requirements and filings and all of this nonsense. So it's a whole lot simpler, easier, and convenient, and of course more profitable. And number two, which is fairly straightforward, but it requires a little explanation, no reserve requirements. Uh, banks are required to maintain, it's called minimum reserve requirements on their deposit. So if you deposit now, you're a German guy, you deposit 1,000 euro in a German bank, the German bank is supposedly required to maintain 10% of that deposit in cash as a reserve requirement. So when you deposit 1,000 euro, they can lend out 900, but they must keep the 100 as cash, and the 100 as cash brings no return. So they can profit or re-lend 90% of their money. But if there is no reserve requirement, it means that if you deposit 1,000, they can re-lend 1,000, and they can profit on the full 1,000 amount. So if you have a reserve requirement of 10%, it cuts your profit by about roughly 10%. And if you have no reserve requirement of 10%, this means you can make 10% more profits. Well, you can guess, guys. Banks love to make more profits. And with the euro dollar, because there is no reserve requirement, they can make at least a 10% more profit, about, okay? So, they really love this thing and it's very attractive to them. So, instead of making 100 million profit, on just because it's unregulated with no reserve requirement, they can make 110 million profit, okay? It's a huge difference for any financial institution. So, that's a second. And the third one, which is, uh, uh, let me put it this way. I'll put it over here because uh, out of these two follows the third one. The third one is just the consequences of these two. It provides a competitive advantage. Competitive 
advantage because you're more profitable and no government regulations means it's the same as more flexible. So if you're not regulated, you have flexibility to make bigger loans, smaller loans, different type of loan. You can tailor it any way you want. So this business flexibility makes you more competitive to the relative to the regulated bank, okay? And if you want to borrow, you definitely want to borrow from the unregulated bank because the unregulated bank can really do it the way to fit your business needs, okay? As opposed to the regulated bank that say, oh, we can't do this, oh, we can't do that. And these are the three major, the three major attractions of the market. And let's take a break. Yeah.